All right. Uh, so glad to see so many of you here on our last day of our conference. Um, my name is Sean Current. I'm a third year PhD student at Ohio State. Um, and today I will be presenting on FAIR EGM, FAIR link prediction um, and recommendation via emulated graph modification. Um, I will do my best to give an overview of this. It's a little more machine learning oriented than a lot of the presentations we've seen. Um, and I know we have a variety of backgrounds. Um, so feel free to come to me afterwards with any questions you might have. I'm happy to explain everything. Um, before we get really into start what we mean by emulated graph modification, um, let's look at some motivation for our work. Um, usage of graph data is widespread throughout all of um, modern humanity at this point. Um, we can think of social media, job networking, online shopping, internet browsing, um, every single one of these impacts us on a daily basis. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the graph data we have is biased simply just due to where it came from um, in our own society. Um, and using this biased data in these recommendation and prediction models um, kind of leads to a bit of a feedback loop. Um, it seems my arrows went missing on this slide, um, but it's supposed to be a nice big cycle for us um, where our biased data creates biased models that creates predictions. And when we use those predictions, I mean, click an ad that we see um, or get a new job or something like that, it creates a feedback because those new things that we've done become the data for tomorrow. Um, and so we really wanna try and cut off the head of this um, and mitigate this bias um, so that this stops happening. I wanna challenge us on what a fair representation should look like. Um, so here we see two kind of examples of what um, our embedding spaces can look like in a biased, which we see on the left, and a fair representation, which we see on the right. Um, in our bias example, we kind of see that our node representations are clustering based off of what we're using as their sensitive attributes. Um, here we can see that in the color. In the top left, we have this kind of blue blob. Um, right below it, we have a brown blob. Um, and there's a lot of um, similarity in terms of your sensitive attribute um, based off of location. Um, in our fair representations, um, this is not the case. It's very mixed um, and it's very difficult to perhaps segregate out a specific attribute. Um, and that's what we hope to achieve. Um, spoiler alert, uh, what you see on the right is what we do achieve. Another thing to note is that um, implementing fairness in machine learning is a balance of utility and fairness. Um, it's very difficult to achieve both simply because a lot of our notions of utility, um, especially in the machine learning literature, require us to fit our observed data. Um, and since our observed data is biased, if we do well at that task, our predictions will also be biased. Um, so a lot of times if we implement a fairness constraint, um, we will do worse at our utility task. Um, here we are looking at link prediction and recommendation in graphs. Um, and so for this, um, we're using some prior work for link prediction um, using some of the work by uh, Kip et al in 2016 um, and doing some link reconstruction there. Um, and what this really means is that when we get our node embeddings, um, our representations of whatever nodes we're looking at in our graph, um, the similarity matrix of those embeddings should resemble our adjacency matrix for our graph. On the fairness side, um, instead of possibly having good predictions that match our um, utility, um, we instead look for more diverse predictions or something that we may not expect given the bias in our graph. Um, and so for our case, we're gonna go ahead and go for demographic parity. Again, there are lots of definitions of fairness um, and we've had plenty of talks on that um, this past weekend and I'm sure many of us know how many different definitions there are if you even glanced at the fairness literature. Um, so for our purposes, we're just gonna keep things simple. Um, for our use case, we are doing this link prediction. So we are defining this as given a specific person, um, the recommendations you make to that person or to that node um, should match demographic parity. Um, and so those recommendations um, the distribution of sensitive attributes across them um, should match what we see in the population. Now, how do we actually do this? Um, 
we are kind of giving ourselves an additional constraint um, in that we want our embeddings to be interpretable. Um, and this is always a kind of difficult thing when you look at machine learning, especially with neural network architectures um, of what does interpretability mean? Um, so for our purposes, we're going to look at what happens if we think about adding new nodes and edge weights to an existing graph. Um, and so in this, I do want to note that our formulations, we are not actually modifying our input graph. Um, whatever you're passing to, whatever neural network is giving you your recommendations, um, it's the exact same raw data um, that you're getting from whatever your data set is collecting. Um, and similarly, whatever output we're doing is only outputting things for those specific nodes, and they're the only ones we consider in our analysis. So all of this adding new nodes and edge weights, it's really only occurring within our neural network architecture and the mathematics that we're doing within it um, and not occurring outside. Um, for this, we are starting with uh, going back to that Kip et al. paper again. Um, we are starting with traditional graph autoencoders. Um, again, I won't go into too many details on this. Um, we do see kind of the mathematical formulation of it in the bottom right of this slide. Um, where our node embeddings, which is that phi, um, are equal to some activation function um, of the product of the adjacency matrix, whatever the previous features were um, in some weight matrix. Um, and for us um, to kind of emulate this adding new nodes and edge weights, uh, we are going to constrain our learning to specific weights that we add into this. And we introduce three distinct approaches to go um, or to achieve this, um, which I'm gonna go into over the next three slides. Our first approach considers adding a partner node to all of the nodes in our existing graph. Um, so for every single node in our graph, we add in another node that we're gonna optimize the features of to correct for this bias. Um, this is actually very simple in terms of the effect it has on your neural network model. Um, it really just equates to adding in this one extra weight there, um, which we're symbolizing as WF. Um, and it's it's very straightforward, just an addition um, that looks like any other bias you might have seen in a machine learning literature, um, except this time we're constraining it to only fair learning. We can kind of look at an extension of this where instead of adding um, a node for every node in our graph, we now add a limited number of nodes. Um, and instead of being connected to a single one, it's connected to everything. Um, this is a little more complicated um, in that now we have not only node features to optimize for fairness constraints, um, but also edge weights. And one of the really important things to note about this method is that um, this number C, which is controlling how many new nodes we add in, um, the blue dots in this case, um, if C is either greater than the minimum number of nodes uh, you have in your overall graph or your minimum number of features, this has the same solution space as your global fairness optimization, that previous approach we just saw. Um, and this is can kind of trivially be seen as um, if you think of how we might change those edge weights so that there's you know only a one here and a zero everywhere else, it kind of equates to our previous definition. Um, so this approach is really only effective or different from what we previously saw in cases where C is small. Um, and so that really equates to adding a rank deficient bias weight, um, which we're symbolizing by the A star and F star um, in this formulation here. Another really important thing to note about this is that we're adding in these extra edges, um, at least in our mind, that's what we're doing. Um, we do not consider these as extending the neighborhood of your node. Um, so if anyone is familiar with graph neural networks and message parsing, messages can't parse along those edges. Um, so really, you can think of them more directed going down into our graph structure. Finally, we consider a fair edge weighting method. Um, this is looking at adding weights to our existing edges. Um, and we optimize these edge weights to correct for bias um, and make fair predictions. Uh, these weights are unconstrained, so they can be pushing or pulling um, your different features um, to or away from 
um, whatever nodes you're considering. Um, so it's really balancing and stretching out or pushing in um, aspects of this graph. Um, and this really just equates to a simple element-wise multiplication of our adjacency matrix with our fairness weights here. Um, so now that I've kind of gone over our methods, how do we actually optimize these? We have two objectives. We have our utility objective, um, going back to the Kip et al that I keep referencing. Um, we have our link reconstruction loss. Um, and this is looking at the binary cross entropy, which is that H of our adjacency matrix and our reconstructed similarity matrix uh, with a sigmoid applied to it so that it's between zero and one. Um, and the W pause here is balancing our positive and negative edges. Um, so if we think of this as a classification task, whether or not we should recommend or whether or not there should be a link that exists between these two nodes, um, this is balancing our two classes. For our fairness objective, um, we are looking at the KL divergence of our population distribution of sensitive attributes um, compared to a, a kind of resemblance of that um, based off of a node level view of this. Um, so we are looking at a, um, take a specific node, we can look at what our predicted scores are or our predicted positive um, probabilities are in our reconstructed um, adjacency matrix from that similarity. Um, and we can track where those scores go to um, in terms of sensitive attributes. And so once we total up all those scores, that should match our population distribution. So we have these two loss functions um, and we can use an alternating minimization to optimize these. Uh, let me go ahead and move this thing here so we can see a little better. There we go. Um, and like I said, we wanna constrain the learning of our fairness criteria um, to specific weights for that interpretability so that we know where these weights are affecting um, and how they are affecting our models. Um, and so here we are minimizing our reconstruction with our normal graph weights, as well as whatever additional neural network layers we might have on there, which I'm just representing by G. Um, and then we are minimizing our link divergence loss only with respect to our WF fairness weights, um, or in the case of our constrained approach, that A star and F star. Um, and this is just using a very straightforward alternating minimization, nothing too special there. Um, in terms of utility, our methods do very well. Um, so we trained and tested on four different data sets um, that are widely used in the graph literature. Um, some of them were uh, some Facebook data sets, others are citation data sets. For citation data sets, we use the topic of the paper um, as a form of sensitive attribute in this case. And so here we have a link prediction on the core data set, and we see that using our AUROC and F1 scores, um, compared to our baselines, as well as some baselines that we got in terms of other fairness literature, fair walk and fair adjust, um, we see very minimal loss in terms of utility. So we're still making good predictions um, in terms of our reconstructed adjacency matrix. Um, but how does it look like when we actually look at how do we do on our fairness criteria? Here, um, we are looking at what we came up with as a DP at K metric. So we look at the top K recommendations and predictions um, for specific nodes and throughout the graph. Um, and then we look at that kind of same um, KL divergence uh, between those top K predictions and the population distribution for our sensitive attributes. Um, and so we hope that this value is lower um, than what we see in our baselines. And that is exactly what we see. Um, for this core data set, every single one of our methods does significantly better than our baseline. Um, and as you go and you widen um, the top number you're looking at, we perform better and better. Um, and so we see that we aren't, um, and so, so we see that we are optimizing both fairness and utility in this case, which is a fantastic thing. Um, and a lot of that, at least in my view, is here, even, even our baselines aren't performing perfectly at the task, which means there's some room to leverage where we are performing well and where we aren't. And so here it's, um, at least in my point of view, we're moving so that we're doing better at our fairness criteria. And we might be doing a little worse um, towards our bias data, 
um, but in the end is balancing out. Um, overall, what you might consider the best variant um, is data specific, um, but generally speaking, uh, GFO performs fairly well. Um, this might not be too surprising since it's the most free method um, to change how things really work, um, but we can look closer into why it works. And so going back to our previous visualizations, we have our initial bias representation that we got from our base graph autoencoder model. Um, and we saw those fair node representations, and these were actually achieved by our GFO. Um, and we can look at um, this text blob seems to have moved around on me a little bit, so it's overlapping. Um, but we can look at what are those WF biases that we add on a node level basis. And these biases also seem to group by our sensitive attributes. Um, and so in, in my mind, the way I see this is if you, if you look at this on the left and you see our blue blob, if we move it down and to the right a little bit, it's overlapping with everything. Same thing with our brown blob. If you move it to the right, it can overlap. And so if we move all of those kind of to the center so that they're all overlapping with each other, um, we would get our nice mixed representation. And that's exactly what these biases are doing. They're moving where our nodes are so that we are maintaining our utility information and our predictive capability um, while removing things that might separate them in our more fair space. Um, and so all of these biases that we add um, end up clustering by our sensitive attribute, um, which really helps us understand what these approaches are doing. In conclusion, uh, we offer three interpretable, me interpretable methods to mitigate bias in these models um, for the purpose of link prediction and recommendation, um, be it on a job networking site or social media or online shopping. Um, all of these methods could be very applicable. Um, we are significantly able to improve on demographic parity fairness um, with little to no cost in model, model utility. Um, we are still performing well at the task set before us. Uh, for future work, we hope to extend this to node classification and other utility tasks, um, incorporate other definitions of fairness, um, investigate further kind of the features of these fairness weights and where really um, what features we need to change in our graph structure in order to make it fair, um, as well as other graph dynamics. Um, thank you for listening to my presentation. Okay. Thanks for the, the presentation. That was interesting. I'm also interested in graph embeddings as well. I had a quick clarification question and then another question. The clarification was, are in the fair edge weighting, does that method change neighborhoods? You mentioned the previous one does not when you add the virtual nodes as connected with everyone. But does this one, uh, would this one cha actually change neighborhoods? This one here? Yeah. Yes, it absolutely can. Um, so these can be zero. Um, as weights, they can be negative. Mm -hmm. um, it is definitely changing uh, how your neighborhoods might be. Um, an important thing to note is that we're only changing existing edges. Um, so anywhere there's not an edge, we are not adding one in. Um, so I guess in that point, it can restrict your neighborhood, but it can't expand it. Got it. Thanks. That was very helpful. The other question I had was that I, it was interesting to see that the, sometimes demographic parity seems in very much in line with the utility that you get. And I wonder um, wh when that might not be the case. Did you see any trends in terms of, is there, for example, a community um, um, structure in which maybe a correlation between affinity groups and interests in which the fact that there is a group that's more um, mm, clustered within your presentation is a signal of their own interest rather than being like necessarily unfair towards them. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to repeat your question so that I understand a little better. Um, so are you asking if we've seen cases where um, utility is going down as we become fairer? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, that can definitely happen. Um, I think one of the, um, it does happen for some of our data sets. I think uh, we test on PubMed, which is um, medicine citations as well. Um, I think we do see it a little bit more there. Um, 
And there might be some other cases where it can be. Um, and really, I just think it's data set specific as to whether or not we can make that exchange. Um, part of the issues for this project is just finding good data for it. I mean, like I said, we were using citation networks, which we all kind of know isn't really, that's not sensitive um, in terms of the topic of a paper. Um, it's really just a proof of concept in that regard. Um, and so there's there's a lot of struggle just finding good data sets for this in the first place. So I'd love to um, test it on more things to see if we do see that happen um, and possibly do what we can to either fix or correct or just do the best we can on whatever data there is. Great, thanks. Hi, uh, really interesting talk. I have two questions. How efficient are your approaches? And the second one is how dependent are your implementation on your uh, weight in its initialization? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we actually talk about both of those in our paper. Um, if we look at our methods, um, I'll start with them and kind of go through one by one. Um, they're actually very efficient um, in that we have to do this alternating minimization. Um, so that adds a little bit on. Um, but in terms of how it's affecting our neural network, um, this is just a very straightforward addition. We aren't actually adding in all of these nodes. So we aren't doubling or quadrupling the size of our adjacency matrix. It's not quadratic in that regard. Um, it's actually very constant um, in terms of just adding in an addition. Um, things can get a little um, more complicated with our constrained fairness optimization. Um, but as long as you're not choosing a bad value of C um, and that it's not wildly large and unnecessary, um, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Um, and one of the interesting things we see about this is that for um, all of the data sets, um, there's, it, it kind of decreases asymptotically the effect you get when you add in um, higher C values. Um, so I think for Cora, um, when C is like 50, I think that's about when you reach your asymptotic minimum. Um, and that's significantly less than the number of features or the number of nodes in that graph. Um, and so really, um, for the most part, as long as you're using it wisely and not doing things you shouldn't be doing with it in the first place, um, it's also very efficient. Um, similarly, for our fair edge weighting, um, it's kind of like our global optimization approach, um, where it's just adding in a nice, easy multiplication and also very efficient. Um, and your next question was about, remind me? The weight initializations. Yes, the weight initializations. Um, we also talk about that in the paper. Um, for this approach, um, it is kind of just random. Um, and we can think of it as just kind of adding noise into our graph. Um, really nothing too special there. Um, it seems to be the best um, in terms of this, this WF um, at achieving this. Um, for some of our other ones, though, um, here, when we initialize A star and F star, we don't want both of them to be random. We want one of them to be random and the other to just be a set of ones. Um, that seems to be the best. Um, and finally, for few, um, we initialize that WF all to ones. And so it's originally looking at um, the adjacency matrix we look in and then optimizing from there. 